welcome to both of you. As ever, let's check out the front pages, shall we? Starting with the Metro, uh, leading with England's Golden Girls, their headline, Lionesses Roar into the World Cup final. The Eye also featuring the Lionesses' triumph in the World Cup. The Daily Mirror describes England's football stars as the history girls. The Guardian describes how the Lionesses are surging into the World Cup final after beating Australia. Daily Mail calls on Spain to bring their red fury against England. The Daily Star has a photo of the Lionesses on its front page with the headline, Dreaming of 66. The Times describes England's footballing heroes as ferocious on their way to the final. Uh, the lead there is the uh, Squeeze and Sunak. The FT, meanwhile, leads with the headline, Underlying Inflation Pressures Keep the Heat on the Bank of England rate setters. Well, a quick reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of the papers while you watch our guests. So let's head straight to them. Um, Ali, why don't you kick off? I mean, some great photography here. All be, you know, praise to the uh, the photographers and the photo editors for some of these pictures, including the, um, the Daily Mirror, you know, a picture of joy, but there's still one <coughs> crucial game to come. Well, there is, and uh, everyone's going to be looking forward to that game on Sunday against Spain. Let's just put it in context, uh, Anna. This is the first mm -hmm. time since 1966, that an England football team has been in a World Cup final. So it's a big moment. It's a big moment. And I think that they played well today. It was a 3-1 victory. I think Australia missed their chances. Sam Kerr, who's their star player, scored an absolute belter. And there were hearts in mouths with two further chances she missed. But they got there. And they haven't played always convincingly in this tournament. But the best teams always find a way to win, even though they're not performing brilliantly. And, and Serena Weekman, to be honest with you, they're... Their manager, 38 matches, one defeat. What a record. What a fantastic record. Big moment on Sunday. And you get confidence, don't you, from being winners before, uh, Euro finalists, Euro winners yes. as well. There's that sense of, uh, of calmness you get from knowing you can deliver. Um, Lester, I don't know, you know how excited the nation will be come Sunday uh, watching this game against Spain. Well, I think the, the front pages themselves will help to, uh, to drum up um, appetite. But I think that, uh, you know, the nation uh, is, is overjoyed that uh, uh, England has got this far and obviously willing it uh, uh, that much uh, further. Um, you know, if uh, the, the women's uh, well, team do actually um, pick up um, the World Cup, I think that will uh, be, uh, um, uh, well, it will be a, a lesson to the men that they need to do a, a little bit better um, as well. Um, so, so I think that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of attention uh, on, on Sunday and I definitely... Uh, wish, wish them well. I think that uh, Australia uh, today, they, they had their moments, uh, but uh, they, cl they clearly can't be a, a one-woman uh, team. But I'm very glad uh, that, uh, that, that, that um, you know, the, some of the papers have framed this uh, around the, the first time uh, an England team has got to uh, the uh, w w World Cup final, because there has been some uh, naysayers uh, on social media that have actually been saying, well, actually, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just the women's team, but actually the popularity uh, of women's football has grown exponentially over the last few years. In fact, I've got, I've got a friend uh, who uh, started out uh, watching the men's game and now hardly watches the men's game at all. He just watches uh, the women's game, which I think is actually a testament to uh, the growing popularity of that sport. Yeah, there's almost more space in the women's game, isn't there? So you feel like more, more, more happens in a way. Um, the Metro has Golden Girls as a mirror, uh, the History Girls, Golden Girls for the Metro, um, and the Eye, uh, Wonder Woman as well. Uh, but what has made the difference? You know, you mentioned the fantastic coach they've got, um, Serena Wiegmann, who's really driven this through. But you've got FA spending money on it. Yes. You've got the, the clubs who've got fantastic women's teams in this country. You know, is there, is, is, is there, is there a coming together of multiple factors? Here. I think there is, and I think we've come a long way since 1971 when, mm. until then, the FA said that uh, football was a game completely unsuitable for females. Well, look how far we've come now. Uh, they're doing better than the men, and I think that there's a lot of grit and determination here. If you look at some of the skill in the women's game, mm. I mean, even in that game uh, today, uh, you actually saw Lauren Hemp make that play for Alessia Rousseau to score the final, uh, the final uh, goal that took, took it over the line. And it would I dissected the entire defence. I mean, that level of skill is exceptional. I wish them well. They can also play in different formations and they showed a lot of grit and determination. Just remember that before this uh, tournament started, they lost three of their key players through injury and other issues. They've struggled with injury the whole way through and they've kept it together. And Serena Wiegman has got this unflappable uh, focus that she brings to the team. It's all very business-like. 
and I'm very hopeful that they can carry this through. It'll be a huge moment for the nation if they do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the finish on that final goal was exceptional as it well, was. wasn't it? Anyway, you're right. It's a lovely distraction uh, from the, the other stuff we have to talk about, which is where we're going now. Uh, so, the Financial Times, underlaying inflation pressures, keep the heat on the Bank of England. Rate setters, um, towards the end of September is the next time we'll get the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee deciding. There'll be another or more inflation figures before then. Uh, but nonetheless, um, although the figures look good today, people still suggesting another interest rate rises on the cards. Uh, yes, no, that's certainly what the, the experts are, are predicting. And, of course, uh, an interest rate rise will put a uh, further squeeze uh, on, on homeowners, which will also have a knock-on effect uh, as well on, on uh, rents as well in the private sector because uh, landlords will put up uh, rents even more. And they've been going up by around 20% in London um, and Manchester over the last uh, year. So, so overall, it's going to add uh, to the, the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. And, yes, inflation's come down um, a little bit, um, but, uh, but core inflation uh, really hasn't moved because, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, when we're factoring in uh, food prices and, and energy prices, uh, energy bills, uh, then, you know, we, we can still see that, uh, you know, that is ahead uh, of where certainly um, public sector wages are. Uh, in fact, most private sector wages as well. There's only one sector uh, within the private sector that's really bucked the trend, which is business um, and, and finance. Uh, so overall, the, the squeeze is, is continuing. Uh, and while, you know, certainly uh, government and some supporters are sort of dressing uh, this up, uh, the, 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 the slight uh, fall in inflation as, as good news, I think it's actually not just about the figures, it's about how people uh, feel and, and, and their bills at the end of the day. Uh, and those are going in the wrong direction, which sort of underlines the uh, underlining weakness uh, of the economy with, with uh, you know, very little growth, with one of the lowest in the OECD, um, and, and, and many other structural uh, weaknesses in the economy. I mean, you make a good point. Just because inflation falls doesn't mean that prices aren't rising, which they are. Well, they still are and rising, And still yes. some, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And the point is, will those prices ever come down? Will they, will they ever return? Will they go back 20%? You know, I mean, this is, this is the state we're at now. Well, I think when the Fed was talking about this being transitory, this inflationary uh, issue, it's certainly not transitory. It's <laughs> extremely sticky, and you're now seeing... Uh, the highest interest rates uh, for 15 years, 5.25% at the moment. And as, as we look to the next month, they may go up again. We expect them to go up again. And Lester's right. If you look at the actual inflation number coming down, <laughs> yes, it's come down to 6.8%. Core inflation still close to 7%. Wages have been increasing. And Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, did warn that if people do go down the road of inflationary wage uh, demands, which is perfectly understandable, by the way, because people are struggling out there. Of course they want to be paid decently, particularly when inflation was close to 10% only a few months ago. And, then it embeds and, and it in those the system. in the public sector feel that the years of austerity... They know, have, but you look at... lost in real terms. Absolutely, that's, that's but you point. look at the public sector, the nurses have got a one-off uh, bonus as well. That's all feeding through. So you're actually, actually probably going to see now, for the first time, average earnings rise faster than inflation for the first time in many years. But no need to worry, because Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, has said he's optimistic and it's all going to be better next year. So there you go. Well, the trouble is, though, that we've had a, a wage squeeze that's, that's lasted, I think, since 2008. We've had the longest wage squeeze, uh, really, since uh, the Napole Napoleonic Wars. Um, and, you know, uh, and, uh, you know there, there's uh, certainly the Bank of England, you know, been talking up this idea of a, a wage price spiral. Um, but, you know, you have to really question that because, you know, inflation was was high as a result of you know the the, the external shocks with uh, with Ukraine absolutely um, and you know and it's coming down uh, you know uh, as even though uh, wages are actually going up um, slightly um, so you know this idea of wage price spiral I think is you know definitely needs a lot more uh, scrutiny rather than being taken at face value. Well, the Times um, has an interview with Rishi Sunak. He's using the word trust me quite a lot. I noticed it yesterday and today, in fact, uh, saying Britons will feel better off next year, uh, he said, while vowing to tame inflation by maintaining discipline on public spending and tax. Uh, in an interview with the Times, the Prime Minister said he passionately believed that he could bring down inflation and revive economic growth. Whether he can halve it from the 10.7% that he promised at the start of the year, one wonders. Well, he might actually achieve it. Look, uh, Richie Sonak is a former investment banker. As every good former investment banker will tell you, they have key performance indicators, and he set five of them at the beginning <laughs> of the year, one of which was to halve inflation uh. by the end of the year. Now, he may very well reach that, but it is actually about how people feel. And Les is right, it's still tough out there uh, for a lot of people. So he's also got pressures, Rishi Sonak. He knows he's staring down the barrel of a gun at the moment. With Labour 20 points ahead in the polls, there's going to be an election probably 
next year, most likely. And he's under a lot of pressure from the right flank of his party to cut taxes. Now, we saw where that uh, movie ended with Liz Truss. There's no panacea here. You can't just simply cut taxes. We've still got 2.5 trillion of public debt, 400 billion of borrowing on the back of COVID. Things are dire. You have to be very sensible. You can't just splash the cash. Honestly, Sorry to be dire. You're depressing me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about it. Um, he, he rejected calls. This is the Times again. I don't know if we can get it. I think we've got it on both. We'll see if we have it. Um, he rejected calls by some Tory MPs to cut taxes, warning that unfunded borrowing would worsen inflation. Right now, the best thing for the country is to bring down inflation. We've heard that before. Uh, this means being disciplined on borrowing, disciplined on spending, whether that is spending on lots of things, public to pay or indeed unfunded tax cuts. So that's goodbye to the tax cuts for now, which we've heard again before. Anyway, I'm going to move on to the I in the absence of the Times. Uh, A-levels. Big week this week. Uh, the I uh, is suggesting that pupils want appeals over downgraded figures, because it's the first time they're being marked properly, I suppose, isn't it? And these are people who've not really sat exams. So, you know, it's a tough, a tough time, definitely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and certainly there's a lot of pressure, there will be a lot of pressure uh, in this sort of really first, you know, post-COVID um, A-level um, uh, set of results mm. uh, with more people uh, pre predicted to go to university, which uh, will inevitably lead to, uh, to more uh, appeals. Um, but, but I think I'll be very interested also to, to uh, you know, dig underneath some of the uh, A-level statistics when they come out tomorrow uh, to actually find out what the breakdown is uh, when it comes to... Uh, you know, private, uh, you know, fee-paying schools um, and, and state schools, because the, that gap uh, widened uh, during COVID, which was partly as a result of, of, of you know, teachers giving the, uh, uh, the, the marks, the grades, as opposed to uh, it going through the normal process. Um, now, will that gap close? I think that's really uh, very important. But, I mean, a tribute to, to everyone who, uh, uh, you know, has taken their A-levels. It's a very, very stressful yeah. uh, uh, thing and to do. And missing GCSEs was the point I was well, making. Well, you know, well, then it, they didn't get the prep for it. Yes, so, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. But also they've, they've, they've done this at a time when, when schools have been really... Uh, squeezed as well. Teachers have been out on on strike, and and you know uh, the, a lot of uh, schools have been under huge financial pressure. So the fact that um, you know these uh, these um, uh, young people have actually uh, you know come through all of this, mm. um, and uh, you know I wish them all the best for tomorrow. Well, I, so do I, and it's a really I mean I get butterf butterflies in my stomach thinking about these poor kids tomorrow getting their results. I still remember it vividly myself. Yet yeah, knowing you're expected to get worse in the last two years. That's right. It's really difficult. It business. is very difficult. And also, let's bear in mind that these are the kids who went through GCSEs during COVID, uh, which were not marked in the, in the normal way. Mm. And therefore, they had very high uh, grade inflation in that. And that coming on the back of that. Now, they're going to have to explain this to universities and to employers who are going to have to factor all of this in. So it's not going to be easy. And about 60,000, the prediction is, 60,000... Uh, students are actually going to fall short of the grades they need to get into their top university mm. first choice. That's going to be a scramble for clearing. Yeah. Again, sharp elbow people who are first on the phones. You've got to be quick and you've got to be sharp to get your place uh, there. It's not going to be easy, but we do need to normalise the grades and get them back to the 2019 levels because rampant grade inflation, I understand why it happened and we know the algorithm and all the rest of it, and it was a really tough time for students and teachers, but we need to get to some semblance of normality again so that we have faith in the grades. Yeah, uh, apologies. I didn't mean to say they hadn't done GCSEs. As you say, not marked in, Absolutely. The, in yeah. the typical way. Um, yeah, stand by the, uh, the clearing phone numbers, I think. It's going to be a very <laughs> easy time for university. <laughs> both. Um, let's go to The Guardian, shall we? Uh, we've already spoken about Rishi Sunak talking about inflation and trusting him on the economy. And um, this is about the so-called pension triple lock. It's what pensioners get paid. Um, the decision on that will come soon. And it could be up to 8%, Ali. Well, that's right. The, the tri triple lock is basically the higher of 2.5% average earnings, which are around 8% at the moment, and inflation, which at the beginning of this year was over 10%. Now, there's been a lot of consternation about this, division of opinion on this. A lot of people within the Tory party, because two-thirds of over 70s vote Conservative, uh, are very uh, keen to keep the triple lock in place. But there has been a cost of living crisis and a lot of intergenerational inequality, or at least a feeling that there's intergenerational inequality as well. So it's interesting that the Tories are sticking to this. Clearly, they want the votes. They need the votes. They're doing a core vote strategy, it appears, at the moment. But they're not really reaching out beyond that. And I think in this time, when we've got the fiscal position we have, I have a lot of sympathy for pensioners. My mother's a mm. pensioner, for heaven's sake. I understand people have worked hard all their lives. They deserve a decent 
retirement. I fully get that and I'm fully supportive. But triple lock in these times when everyone's been suffering so much, particularly young people can't get on the housing ladder, I think this is the wrong thing to do. I think the Tories should have the guts to actually say we're going to scrap this. Given that average earnings are already 8%, go with one of the two, not, not the triple but, lock. But, but that's the point, isn't it? There are no earnings for pensioners. They have no chance to go out and get a wage. And there are some very rich pensioners. There are also a lot of very poor pensioners. You know, So should there be some charity where the very rich ones can pay in and give up their state pension, You know, some other system? I'm um, going to go to the Times, if you don't mind, Lester. Uh, the Crown Prince... Uh, Saud, uh, of, of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, is expected to visit Britain this autumn, the paper saying, uh, for the first time since the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, which horrified the world. Uh, yes, absolutely. And there were many things that um, um, the the, Saud, uh, the House of Saud uh, are being being accused of. Uh, the, the murder of uh, uh, the journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi is definitely uh, one of them. Um, but um, in some ways, uh, this is not unexpected uh, in the sense that uh, you know the uh, no, no matter what um, certain uh, for, you know, regimes are, are accused of. You know, when their head of state uh, comes, we tend to roll out uh, the red carpet, sometimes even give them, uh, you know, a, a, a state uh, visit. Um, but clearly there will be uh, a lot of uh, dissent um, as a result of that. You know, we're going to be hearing uh, a lot from uh, you know, people, dissidents, who've, uh, who've had to flee um, Saudi Arabia. I think the, the issue of Yemen will, will come into uh, play as well. Uh, you know, that's more or less sort of died down uh, since the, the United States and Joe Biden sort of pulled uh, support effectively uh, from Saudi Arabia to conduct that, that war. But it's still uh, a major humanitarian uh, disaster. So, so there's a lot that um, um, sa uh, the, uh, Saudi Arabia is being accused of. LGBT rights uh, will certainly uh, come up there as, as well. So uh, these type of visits, uh, even though, uh, you know, on, on one level, at a higher level, uh, they may be sort of, you know, beneficial uh, to Saudi Arabia. On another level, it's, it guarantees bad publicity. Uh, except, except Saudi Arabia is a key ally of the US and UK and has been for, you know, for decades, isn't it? It's purely it? about geopolitics. That's what it is. Mm. This is pure real politique. The fact of the matter is Mohammed bin Salman is very ambitious. He wants one trillion of investment in his country to diversify away from oil. He wants Britain to be part of that. Britain wants to be part, to strike a, a trade deal with the Gulf Corporation Council countries, which will yield 1.6 billion a year to this country. That's what this is about. They're going to they're gonna look beyond the Jamal Khashoggi thing. Obviously, Mohammed bin Salman says that he had no involvement in it. And, uh, but obviously, we know that this journalist went into the uh, embassy in, in Turkey and didn't come out alive. So anyway, that's by the... That, that, that's there for everyone With to know. It's a revolting audio. Uh, uh, audio absolutely. Yeah. So, 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 look, this is purely about real politique and pragmatism, and that's what the government is doing. It is putting trade ahead of ethical foreign policy. Remember how that ended for Robin Cook in 1997? Yeah. You can talk a good game... When the rubber hits the road and you meet reality, you have to do some deals with some pretty unsavoury people, yeah. including the Saudis. And we take their oil, by the way, yeah. which we are begging for to a reduction in price. Yeah. Billions of pounds we pay them for oil. Yeah, lots to discuss anyway. Um, final quick story, less than a minute, if you don't mind. Uh, the gem heist at the British Museum. What got nicked and how is the question. <laughs> now, I well, it's, it's, it's quite funny. Uh, a little while ago, I used to work for a different paper, uh, New Nation, and so we reported uh, on a case of, uh, of a Pan-African um, uh, man who actually uh, went to the British Museum and, and took um, an ancient African artefact, uh, not to steal it, but basically, in his, in his words, to reclaim it. <laughs> um, you know, on the on the yeah. part of on behalf of uh, of his ancestors. So, uh, uh, an interesting story here, obviously, in the Daily Mail in relation to uh, to this th very different uh, uh, very different case there. Um, um, so, um, but but you know, once again, it sort of you know brings into focus the fact that uh, you know almost everything uh, in the British Museum has been uh, um, you know acquired through very dodgy uh, means. So this is one way of decolonizing the British Museum, is it? To nick stuff. We will have to, we'll have to talk more next I didn't, didn't quite say that, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, Lester Alley, thank you very much indeed. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.